Welcome to All the F Words, a podcast where two writer friends nearly 30 years apart explore everything we give an F about. I'm Gabby Moskowitz. And I'm Joanne Green. On each episode of All the F Words, we'll focus on a theme starting with the letter F. Things like friction, fraction, and fiction. What about faction? That too. We'll share stories from our lives and our distinct generational perspectives and look to experts for insights and ideas. Today, we are going to talk about firebrand Elsie Robinson, a feminist icon we're going to bet you've never heard about. 100 years ago, Robinson was an American newspaper columnist who pushed readers to rethink gender inequality. A hundred years ago. Today on All the F-Words, we are joined by journalist Allison Gilbert, co-author of the book, Listen World, how the intrepid Elsie Robinson became America's most read woman. Welcome, Allison. I am reading your book and I am loving it. Oh, I'm so thrilled that you're reading it. Thank you so much. Allison, this is not your first book. In fact, we met back in 2006 when you were promoting your book, Always Too Soon, Voices of Support for Those Who Have Lost Both Parents. Fred, our producer, and my husband and I produced a podcast series for Seal Press. You are still with Seal Press called By Women for Women. And this was before anyone knew what a podcast was. I think you had to get your podcast on iTunes or maybe you had to distribute it yourself. But it was so long ago that you'd forgotten about it. (laughs) I feel so terribly that I forgot it. I'm sure it was the best interview I have ever done (laughs) until right now. Said by the woman who has recently been interviewed by the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, and NPR. Allison, you are, you've made it. Well, I don't know if that's a definition of making it. I feel like this book is um, striking a chord, and that is so gratifying because as I was researching this book for so long, 11 years, um, By some calculations, we can even talk about maybe almost 30 years. Um, I just feel honored to be able to tell this Elsie Robinson story and to make sure more people know who this pioneer was, because I have been so inspired by her story. And having read Mm -hmm. your book, I have been inspired by her story, and it is darn near criminal that I, a female journalist and feminist talk show host from the 70s, had never heard about her and in the Bay Area where she Mm -hmm. was and where she wrote. And I think it really calls attention to the fact that we have not, and this is on all of us, we have not told women's stories. And this woman was extraordinary. How did you first hear about her and how did you become interested? Well, it's an interesting story and it actually relates to how you and I first met in terms of the topics that I had been writing about, which was grief and loss. So after my mother died, I went back to my childhood home to pack up her belongings as one needs to do. And I was just having a tough time doing it quickly. I wanted to go through every one of her books and see what she had annotated, if she had left anything inside, like a piece of paper or, I don't know, I was hoping for a note or, you know, something from my mom, a tether. And lo and behold, something did in fact fall out of one of her books. And it was a folded up piece of paper. And on that piece of paper, my mom had typed a poem, like retyped a poem. It was attributed to someone named Elsie Robinson. Oh, wow. And it was a poem about grief. It was a poem about loss. But what made it special was that it was tough love. It was not sappy. It was not syrupy sweet. Basically, the message was, feel lucky you had a mother worth missing. Hmm. And it just struck me. So it was like that tone I needed to hear in that moment. And I just had to learn who was 
this Elsie Robinson. I had no idea. I have the chills right mm. now because, first of all, Elsie was the vehicle for your mom to send you a message in that moment, <laughs> A. And then, B, your mom gave you Elsie Robinson. And basically, without saying so, she said, go take this and run with it with all the skills and talent and insight that you have. There are no words. Allison, that's remarkable. Well, it feels um, like a blessing. It feels that I've had a gift. And during the writing of this book, I can say, because my mom has been gone for nearly 30 years, I have not felt as close to my mom as I have um, by virtue of writing and researching this book, it's been it's been a wonderful experience in that capacity. In addition, of course, to all the wonderful professional, you know, relevatory experiences I've had writing what is the first biography of Elsie Robinson uh, to be written. What was the beginning of your research like? You found this poem. You were inspired. You said that this process has been going on for nearly thirty years. How did you begin your research? It was tough because when you first thought about research back then, if you looked online, there was nothing about Elsie Robinson. There was a desert. Now, of course, when you research Elsie Robinson or put her name into a search engine, things are popping up because my co-author and I have made it so, right? We are talking about Elsie Robinson. We have written about Elsie Robinson. But back then, it was an information vacuum. And it was hard. There is no still Elsie Robinson database or repository. You know, when a biographer, for example, writes a book, let's say, about I don't know, William Randolph Hearst, Elsie Robinson's boss. There are William Randolph Hearst papers, you know, all of his artifacts, photograph, co co photographs, correspondence that exist in the Bancroft Library. There is no such Elsie Robinson section of the Bancroft, but what we had to do is actually reverse engineer our reporting and so to find the men who employed her and go to their archives. So the William Randolph Hearst papers did actually have a treasure trove about Elsie Robinson. But unless you knew Elsie Robinson's name, past historians would have dismissed that as being unimportant or Elsie Robinson who? And so we had to go through the editors and the publishers who employed her. And because her rise to fame was so early in the 19 teens, 20s, up to the 50s, her bosses were always men. And so we had to go that way and go down those paths. Tell us about Elsie. How did she become interested in journalism? writing columns, and ultimately really being a pioneer in terms of women's rights, human rights, um, all sorts of things. Well, I'll start from the beginning, like the headlines. So Elsie Robinson came from nothing, and she became the highest paid woman writer in the entire William Randolph Hearst media empire, she had more than 20 million readers. And just to put 20 million into perspective, today that's double the number of subscribers to the New York Times. That's insane. So she had a, it's insane. So she had a voice. She had what we would call today a platform. And so her opinions landed and they were heard and they were provocative. And people knew the name Elsie Robinson and they certainly knew the name of her column. You know, our book, our biography is called 
listen world. But we borrowed that because that was the name of Elsie Robinson's column. And so I think to start there with how popular she was is really important because then everything else kind of lands in its place. When we talk about the subjects that she chose, just to know who was then reading her commentary is very crucial because then it underscores how important it was that she chose those subjects. Was it really unusual for a woman to have a column and for the column to be about something other than household tips and recipes? Well, she started in that lane because that's where lots of women had to begin. She had a column called Cry on Geraldine's Shoulder, and she was Geraldine. Uh, She also had a Cheer Up column. That's literally what they called it. And the fuller name is just equally awful. I'm going to try to remember it off the top of my head. It was like Cheer Up, colon, Curtains, collars, and cutlets. So all of the things in a housewife's domain, right? The curtains on the on the on the windows, the collars, because you're of course doing all the laundry and the ironing, and the cutlets, because of course you were in the kitchen making dinner uh, for your husband to come home um, every night. Because of course, as a woman back at the turn of the century, it was more likely than not that the woman was the one at home, and so she played into those roles to get her start. Which is so interesting because I'm remembering her experience of married life wasn't so positive. There was a whole thing about how she really wasn't great at keeping house. It sounds like she was doing what she needed to do to get published. What, what Can you speak to that at all? Oh yeah, you're absolutely right. She hated it. She hated everything about it. She thought it was drudgery. And she thought that a woman who measured her her appeal um, based on how, you know, beautiful her, you know, sideboard was, was <laughs> um, atrocious. But I would say this, it wasn't because she devalued motherhood. It wasn't because she devalued what it meant to be a spouse. She just embraced one word that was more powerful than all the rest. It was and. Mm. She had a great quote that said something like this. Husbands didn't stop being active men just because they were married. Why must wives stop being active women once they tied the knot. Mm -hmm. And so for her, she wasn't devaluing any of that. She just wanted there to be and. She wanted there to be more. She didn't want these false binary choices. Options. It was all about the options. Yeah, she was talking about the idea. Yes, absolutely. I was just going to say, she was talking about the idea of having it all before we were talking about having it all. I think you're absolutely right. And some some of her most incredible, you know, quotes that I now take to heart about gender inequality, about men and women, and will they ever, you know, be equal? They were written in the early 1920s. And the reason why that's important is that that's more than a decade before Gloria Steinem was even born. And I think that we consider um, feminism through the lens and through the eyes and through the pens of those incredible writers like Gloria, who did get the glory and who was and who were able in a more modern way to cultivate, to curate their legacies. And I think Elsie is not free of blame. Before she died, she could have cultivated and curated her legacy so it would then endure, but she didn't. But well, I do think it's important. Thank goodness you have, right? 
Yeah, thank you. No, it's been such a pleasure. And I feel if we can then reintroduce her to modern readers and reclaim her as being an early advocate for women's rights, for equal pay, for all of these things that we're still talking about today. I mean, it's kind of unbelievable. But just to know that it came well before Gloria, it came, you know, the um, Feminine Mystique, the Betty Friedan, you know, wonderful book, that was 63. You know, Elsie was already gone by then and had already talked for decades about these issues. Did she receive much blowback, Allison? Oh my gosh. My favorite example of that is from some of the men who wrote to her in letters. She receives like 2,000 letters every day in response to her column. It was extraordinary. She had to hire three secretaries. By the way, all of them were men. We can talk about why she only wanted to choose male secretaries, but we can leave that for later, but she had 2,000 letters a day. And one issue that men had was basically, how dare you even name your column, listen world, who are you, Elsie, woman, to tell me how to think, how to feel, how to act, the audacity of her even titling her column something declarative like that, like, listen to me, listen to what I have to say. Uh, one man even wrote in to say, you know what? Why don't you stay in your lane talking about parenting and family and leave the other stuff to other writers? I.e. male writers. It's incredible. But they read her, right? They wouldn't be writing letters if they hadn't read her. She was obviously touching a nerve. They were interested they were seeing what she was telling them to think, and then they were responding. I also think they were responding to her editorial cartoons. We haven't spoken about that yet, but part of what made Elsie a unicorn was her unique skill set. So not only was she this incredible writer, but she also was a remarkable illustrator. And that's very unusual even today. Even today, editorial and political cartooning is a men's world. Uh, there are far fewer women in that field than men. And also normally, writers write and artists illustrate. And it's unusual for someone to do both. And she did. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be back in just a minute with more from Allison Gilbert, co author of Listen World. Could you tell me a little bit about your work with your co author and how you two came together to work on this project? Julia Shears is just about the best partner any writer could have. And quite simply, the book would not be in your hands today if it wasn't for her work on this project. She was invaluable. She is this incredible narrative nonfiction writer. And together, we were able to really bring our best selves, bring our best skill sets to bear. And I desperately wanted a partner on this project. It was hard. Um, I was really having a tough time telling the story on my own. And having a partner, having a teammate, well, you guys know, you guys are teammates. There's something extraordinary about being able to uh, run ideas by someone, uh, be told actually that's not going to work and here's why, be convinced of going in a different direction, learning from somebody um, as skilled as Julia. I learned from her. She is just, um, she's a rock star and I could not have asked for a better partner. Mm. Did she know much about Elsie Robinson before you started the project? She knew zero. Oh, wow. 
I mean, I knew a lot more than her by the time we really started parting because I had been researching Elsie for so long. But no, I had to woo Julia to be on this project with me. I had to go to her and convince her. You know, there's a common headline in all the reviews that we've gotten so far. You mentioned, you know, the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. I mean, the headlines are fairly consistent, which is like Elsie who? And that was Julia's reaction too. But until you really get to know her story, um, you might be hesitant. But then once you do, a woman who uh, came from nothing, who went through incredible challenges to go after her dream of being a writer, um, she was knocked down so many times and just kept getting up. And the fact that she worked in a California gold mine uh, to make ends meet for three years and she worked among men in this gold mine, it almost sounds so unreal that Julia was hooked as much as I was. There needs to be a film made of this. Have you gotten approached yet? Because I bet you will. Oh, gosh, that would be the dream. I could totally see this as a film. Who should play Elsie, do you think? Well, I was going to ask you that very question. Um, I'm thinking not. Um, why am I blanking on her name? Her Ju With a big, huge smile. Oh, Julia Roberts? You probably need a few Elsies, right? Because uh, one thing that I was so compelled by is how, I mean, her upbringing is so interesting. You guys spent a lot of time in the book on her early days. There is a lot of focus on how she grew up, what she was like as a young person. Can you tell me a little bit about the choice to include so much of her background? Well, I would say two things. I think that based on the first part of where you were coming from about the film, I don't know. I don't think we need to be so you know, close to the book, I think that we could probably condense her childhood in one easy flashback, if at all. Um, I do think that we can kind of go into her story in a way that is like that most exciting choice and those pi those pivotal moments that we can, you know, her leaving her husband behind or her being in the gold mine. I feel like there's other places to begin, but that said, um, I do love fantasizing about the film. Uh, it's clear that my mind has definitely gone there for sure. But her childhood is very formative. And I think that we are all products of where we grew up. And for her in particular, and I kind of related to this, even though I'm on the other coast, I'm in New York, Benicia was incredibly international when she was born and when she was raised. It's on the water. It's 30 miles north of San Francisco. It is a ship-heavy community with sailors, with stevedores, with gamblers, with, you know, uh, prostitutes, uh, cowboys, <laughs> prostitutes yeah. cowboys. I mean, there were uh, people from all over the world who gravitated to those shores. And of course, that meant people of different colors, people of different religions, people with different dialects, and of course, languages. And so when you look out of your own childhood bedroom window, and the sights and the sounds and the smells are so rich, I think it gives you a perspective of the world that is not homogenous, that there is value in otherness. And I think that comes through in her writing throughout her entire life. And Elsie wasn't just a columnist. She also wrote fiction. She also wrote poetry. She also was a breaking news reporter. So I feel like that sensibility came through throughout her writing. She also worked tirelessly. The amount that she wrote, the amount of output. Tell us a little bit about that. 
Yeah, that's insane, isn't it, Joanne? I, I found it to be, we did an exhaustive survey of all her writing, and we calculated that in her career, which spanned 40 years, more or less, she wrote 9,000 pieces. Whether or not those were columns or essays or poems, 9,000 pieces of content, right? If you want to put the word that we would use today, you know, sometimes writing six days a week. Today, when we think about columnists, even for the most prestigious newspapers, they are not writing up to six days a week. She herself felt that it was a crushing amount of work. She complained to William Randolph Hearst himself in the most bold audacious way that I am no longer a writer. I am a factory. You don't pay me enough. I need more vacation. And she even used the word remote work before we would actually use the word remote. You know, she wanted to work from home and not always have to go into the office because it was just a crushing amount of time spent on putting thoughts to the page. And um, ultimately it wasn't, I must say, you know, that's not to be lauded. I'm not saying that's a great example of how to be. She did not have what we would call work-life balance at all. In fact, she would call it overwork. She was suffering from what she would call overwork and her body paid the price and um, her relationships suffered as well. She did not have deep friendships that did not sustain her. And um, her marriages, plural, did also, um, they also did not fare well. And so I think there was a bit of, um, you know, there was a lot of upheaval in her life that was caused by the consistent necessity of turning in copy and having a byline. It was tough. It wasn't all great. And she was a single mother for much of that time with a child who was medically fragile. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought up her son, George. So George was born in 1904 and throughout his entire life was chronically ill. Um, he had asthma. And I think today, even though asthma is still a very serious condition, the treatments for asthma were clearly not as far along, of course, as they are now. As an example, there were no steroids to like make you feel better. And so many times, and I'm not overstating this fear, and as a mom, Myself, when I read her experiences about seeing her son, his limbs turn blue, feeling his limbs grow cold because of the lack of the ability to breathe, um, fearing that he would perhaps die after a incredible coughing fit, I felt for her um, everything that she did was to make enough money for she and George to live together without the benefit of support from George's dad, her husband, um, Christy, because she left him. She left her husband in 1912 to go through every step that she could to have a richer life. Her and incredibly she wealthy husband. Yes. I mean, that's... <laughs> That's actually a really good point, Gabby, because she, if you were trying to measure your life based on comfort, she had it made. Her husband was incredibly wealthy. They lived in a house that was enormous. Quite literally, it was a mansion, 37 rooms. It was one of the most pretentious dwellings in all of Vermont, so said the local newspaper when it was raised in the 1930s. And despite the comfort, she wanted to leave 
to go for whatever that dream was. And that's what I find so relatable about Elsie Robinson. Like you may not want to be a writer, listener, listening to us right now. You may have another dream all together. You may want to be, you know, a banker. You may want to go into finance. You may want to be an actor. I mean, who knows what everyone wants to be? That's in everyone's heart. But what would you do for that dream? How uncomfortable would you be willing to be? How much risk are you willing to take? And Elsie risked it all. And I find that to be really the drumbeat of this story that I find to be the most heartening, the most instructive to everybody is just inspiring. Absolutely inspirational. Almost as though it's made up. I mean, it really, the fact that it's really happened and you did all this research and you're telling us about a person who actually lived and, and not only lived, but you know, exceeded well beyond expectation and well beyond her own dreams. Let's talk for a few moments, Allison, about some of the topics that she wrote about where she really stuck her neck out um, to say what she believed in and to influence the thinking of others at her time. Well, she railed against capital punishment. In fact, some of her editorial cartoons were so shocking. Um, so I think, um, potentially triggering that before we actually printed them in Listen World, our book, this biography that we're talking about, Elsie Robinson, we had to make sure that we were comfortable even printing what she had to say. Because even today through our much more, you know, present day eyes and our sensibilities, her views as they were presented back then were still shocking. She was against capital punishment. She thought there was this industrial complex that, you know, far, far um, criminalized, you know, people of color uh, than uh, her white contemporaries. And I feel like those conversations are still playing out. That's remarkable. She wrote about racism and how it was unfair for Black performers to be not allowed to perform uh, in certain venues, large venues in Washington, D.C., in the nation's capital. And then during World War II, she was really advocating for the safe not return, but for the safe welcoming of Jews fleeing Europe. And she used her platform to really rail against anti-Semitism here in the United States and that people should get, get up, be open, welcome the Jews who were fleeing their lives. And she devoted many columns to that. Wouldn't it be amazing if some newspaper or series of newspapers would reprint her columns today? They sound so timely and dealing with some of the very same issues that we are contending with today. It'd be interesting. I think that would be extraordinary. Um, We actually put together a database of Elsie Robinson's columns. You know, none of these or most of them were not even digitized. So you can imagine the work. And so we created what really amounts to as a visual so people can think about what it looks like an Excel spreadsheet that would talk about the date of the column, the editorial cartoon, the actual writing, uh, the newspaper where it appeared or newspapers, right? These are all Hearst uh, papers or independent papers that carried Hearst content. And so this is a remarkable database of Elsie Robinson writing. And then, of course, we put the subject matter in. So you can go in there and search her perspective on family, parenting, anti-Semitism, race, uh, women, motherhood. I mean, you can think about the Google search terms that you would use, and that's what we've done to create this database. So I I do think um, there is a space where it would be so interesting. You're right, Joanne. How great would that be? 
Where does one find this database? Well, we would love this database to end up in a repository. You know, we had talked about during this conversation um, that there is no Elsie Robinson place to go to get all of her writings. But now Julie and I have amassed this database. And so we're looking for a partner. We would love to find an institution that would want to house this incredible treasure trove. So if you're listening, Mm -hmm. if you are listening, please get in touch with Julia Shears or me, Allison Gilbert. We would love to hear from you because we have it all. An anthology of... um her, you know, some, some selections of your favorite columns with, um, you know, some commentary would also be something that certainly I would be interested in. I think that would be a great next book. Well, I'm wondering if you thought when you were reading through at least the beginning part of Listen World, I'm sure you noticed that we took great pains to include her voice yes. in italics. And mm-hmm. so we didn't just quote one or two Elsie Robinson quotes. We tried to elevate Elsie almost to an equal author. Mm -hmm. So Elsie's voice is in fact braided throughout the book because we knew uh, a reader is hard pressed for time. They're not going to go find the Elsie Robinson columns on their own or her poetry or her essays or her fiction. And so we include it throughout the narrative. Did you see that, Gabby? What did you think of that? I love that. I actually, I listened to the audio book which was great. And I loved the way that, that my experience of that was, uh, it did really kind of feel like you were passing the mic around. And I really enjoyed that. It felt like she was piping up. Um, and I thought that that was, I thought that that was so great. I loved that. It felt like she was there really part of it. The passing of the mic was intentional because it's too frequent. It is too often that women's histories are erased. And so for Julia and me as two women authors to further push aside Elsie's own words while we are trying to tell Elsie's story just felt actually foolish. And Mm -hmm. so the structure of the book to me um, came from that desire to elevate Elsie, to tell her story And who better to tell her own story than Elsie herself, right? Women should tell their stories unfiltered. And so that's what we tried to do uh, by incorporating her voice that way. Amen. She didn't give us a memoir, and that would have been wonderful. But um... No, she did. She did. She did give us a memoir. She wrote a book in 1934 called I Wanted Out. Mm-hmm. About her marriage, yes. Oh my gosh, such That's a good right. title. That's right. That's yes. right. Well, it was a particular moment in her life, but you have managed to capture the totality, or at least the highlights of it. And it is an extraordinary read. Gabby and I both highly recommend Allison and Julia's book. It's entitled Listen World, How the Intrepid Elsie Robinson Became America's Most Read Woman. And Allison, who would you like to play Elsie in the film version? Oh my gosh, I have so many fantasies. I am not going to say because I don't want my my wish list to be, you know, somehow... Um, preclude other actors from wanting to to play the role but my gosh I do have some favorite ideas I bet you do we can't we can't encourage you to just share one or two mm, I don't think so what about so. you what about when in the film maybe they do uh maybe there are these two intrepid uh writers who are writing a, a biography of Elsie <laughs> who's going to play who's going to play you Oh my gosh. Well, that would be fun. I'll do a cameo. There you go. go. I love that idea. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks so much for listening to all the F words today. I am sure you can find Listen World, How the Intrepid Elsie Robinson Became America's Most Read Woman anywhere. We always encourage you to go to your local booksellers 
The audiobook is available as well as that's how Gabby read the book. You can find all the F words anywhere you get your podcasts and please follow us on social media. We are on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at All the F Words Pod. And we would love to hear from you. Send us an email. We are at All the F Words Pod at gmail.com. Bye bye. 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 <laughs>